Dr. Mazuri, in talking of comparative forms of slavery, it's also been pointed out by scholars that Africans themselves practice a form of slavery within uh, native African countries or between nations, between uh, various countries. How does the African form of slavery differ from the slavery that was practiced by Arabs and by Europeans? Or is there any difference? Oh yes, there are definite difference. It's a kind of triple heritage of slave systems. Yeah. So it's so indigenous, uh, Arab, and then Western. Yeah. Uh, and the indigenous is first important for people to realize that it's, it's only a small minority of African societies which did have slave systems. So the majority of African societies did not have slave systems, but there were minority of slave societies which did. Uh, the slave systems, one major difference is they were not commercialized, so uh, people were not bought and sold. So this, this was not chattel slavery. Uh, you did not capture them in order to sell them to others. So there were domesticated slaves, the usually captives in war, uh, that were kept among the victors. And then there was a high level of this gene genealogical and cultural assimilation. Uh, they then, over time, became part of the group which had conquered them in the first place. They just got absorbed. So you didn't have this style in the United States where a group like African American remained separate and distinct for centuries. Yeah. Uh, uh, where the enslaved among uh, the Baganda, for example, gradually became Baganda. They became Baganda. They became indistinguishable from the people who had conquered them uh, in, in the first place. And uh, as, so those are two diff different but related reasons. So the domestic system was non-commercial. Uh, people didn't capture for sale. If you captured for sale, it immediately escalated in, in size the scale of the slave system became much larger. Uh, and, and, and secondly, um, the enslaved gradually were assimilated into the conquering group uh, before very long. And people were hardly ever captured just to be enslaved. They were captives of war. The war were con wars were usually conducted for other reasons. And then the captives of war became uh, among the enslaved in those societies. So it was more of an indentured servitude kind of slavery. Yes, but you wouldn't say, we need more slaves, let's go and raid a country. But you would say, we need more pasture. And those people have started encroaching on our land. I think... Uh, before sunset, day after tomorrow, let's raid. And then you, su you are successful and you capture uh, 15 uh, men and seven women and you, you bring them home. Mm -hmm. Dr. Masuri, what role uh, are African American leaders playing in the international reparations movement? Uh, well, quite a number are interested in what uh, our group is trying to do uh, and uh, have attended some of our meetings uh, that we have held uh, in in Africa uh, for that purpose. Ron Walters at ha Howard University uh, travels a lot uh, in Africa uh, and comes to some of our meetings that are connected with re reparations. And we do have, as our rapporteur general of the Group of Twelve, uh, not an African-American, but a Jamaican diplomat, uh, uh, Ambassador Thompson, who is Jamaica's, uh, currently a Jamaica's ambassador to Nigeria. But he's the rapporteur general and a member of, the, of Twelve. We also wanted to have an African-American congressperson as a member of the group. Uh, and we had explored uh, this possibility with one or two relevant people in Congress. Who were they? Um, I'm not authorized to divulge uh, 
names. Okay. Yeah. But it did. There was a legal problem, uh, and the, and the legal problem arose because our committee, because it was appointed by the Organization of African Unity, was therefore answerable to a body which consisted of other governments. And there was therefore the legal issue as to whether a member of the U.S. Congress uh, could join a committee which was answerable to other governments outside the United States. You see. Uh, and we may have to give up this ambition of having a U.S. Congress person and just negotiate with some other African-American. Uh, Member, we need, we need an African American anyhow, but we, we are hoping to have contact into Congress uh, as a way of linking linking with the power structure simultaneously. You see. Uh, but uh, the legal problem may be insurmountable, and so we may have to negotiate with uh, other African Americans for African American representation on the Committee of Twelve. Mm -hmm. Dr. Masuri, there are a lot of people who I've spoke to about the issue of reparations uh, here in America who really question whether or not African Americans are at a stage of metamorphosis of, of, of overcoming the, the mental shackles of, of slavery to the point that we would know what to do with monies if it ever came to the point that there was a dispensation uh, of reparations uh, redress. Mm -hmm. What should we be doing here in America to prepare African Americans for a potential or future uh, uh, monetary form of redress? Yeah, if you if you remember my my three categories. If you applied those to the African American condition, that capital transfer, skill transfer, and power transfer, a form of empowerment, you see. And that we, we would really need within the United States uh, to see how the resources, even in those that are part of capital transfer, how those can be transformed into skills. Uh, because it is true that it's, uh, we could misuse them if we just distribute them. Next, next Monday, please come, there's some money to be distributed, you see. Uh, and I turn up and collect my share, and, and it may be that I've been unhappy uh, with my car, and I go buy another car, you see. Uh, what's, what's the big transformation that has occurred to the black condition as a result of my getting a more expensive car, you see? Uh, uh, my children uh, are African Americans. You see, I'm, I'm a Kenyan, but my my children are African Americans, um, uh, and uh, they get all this money. What, what do they do? They go buy expensive cars. You see, uh, I really want a situation where where we can utilize those uh, resources much more creatively. Mm -hmm. You see. Well, what is the consensus within your group? Mm -hmm. And I know you're you're coming f uh, at this whole issue from an international standpoint, and not just from an African American perspective. But yeah. what is the general consensus among, amongst uh, your group mm -hmm. in terms of how best the reparations should be handled? Mm -hmm. I'll I'll tell you confidentially in the presence of all these millions of people. <laughs> 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 Some of us also have strong reservations about entrusting reparations to the very people who appointed this committee of 12, because they are African governments, you see. Because some of us say, look, I mean, African governments, you guys have been mishandling African resources uh, for the last 30 years since independence. Uh, why should you be trusted with billions more? Uh, when you haven't fulfilled your responsibilities before. So, although at the moment we, we may not say that very directly to our, to our Organization of African Unity, uh, I will suggest certainly that separate institutions be created, you see. Separate institutions, perhaps separate banks be created, uh, entrusted specifically with the reparations banks for reconstruction, uh, or whatever name 
uh, is envisaged, you see, uh, with people who are appointed who are impeccable financial credibility and integrity uh, to run those things and who are not subject to governmental pressure, you see. So we may have to invent institutions to use those resources uh, to the greater benefit of our people, you see, uh, in, instead of entrusting those resources to present institutions which have not so far performed all that well. It's true here in Africa, in, in, in the United States, among African Americans, we worry about whether we have overcome slave mentality. And in Africa, we worry about whether we have overcome colonial mentality, you see, whether we still behave like a colonized people all the time, you see. Back here in the U.S., Dr. Masrui, it seems that we have a difficult time getting our own Congress and Senate to agree on anything to pass even the most marginal legislation. And getting back to the whole issue of reparations, are we going to have to depend on the international community, the African continent itself, to deliver us or to, to, to gain reparations, mm. or do you think that, it, that the possibility is there for it to come from uh, here in America? Uh, I think both. I think the possibility of within the United States is there, but there has to be a groundswell of a movement. So we really have to get African Americans really convinced of the case and get them to agitate for it, to be engaged in it. At the moment, Congress may say, okay, there's so there are a few African-Americans who feel strongly about it. There are a few intellectuals who say something about it. There are a few congressmen who, who feel strongly about it. But the bulk of the African-American population is worried about other matters. So we don't involve the population, you see. If we involve the population, if it became one of the major areas of the African-American agenda, it does stand a chance, even in this country, uh, to convince Congress, look, you better do something about it because this is a major grievance that we have. And, uh, the society has better pay up for its historic sins. Mm -hmm. So is that the way that you see that perhaps uh, the, the whole issue of longevity, how long it's going to take for this thing to kind of evolve and, and come to a head, is by passing that on, by getting that groundswell of support, and then uh, subsequent generations will kind of keep it going? Is oh yes, I think, I, absolutely, I think both in Africa and here, I think it's very important to engage the people, as, may, as many of our own people as possible, as well as get allies among other groups, you see. Uh, because without that, uh, that degree of commitment and uh, engagement in the cause, we won't be taken seriously. Why should Congress take it, take it seriously? You see? I mean, uh, they're not bothered even about appealing against the death penalty on racial grounds, you see. Uh, they won't even do that. Yeah? I mean, and many African-American uh, congressmen are prepared to compromise on those issues. They're prepared to let uh, additional capital punishment offenses be put on. You know, I don't know what we are doing. Uh, we know most of these victims are going to be our people, and most of them are in death row because of a historical reason, a long string of historical causation. It did not happen because they were black or because they had particular kind of hair. It happened because they were enslaved and they have been discriminated against for centuries and now they are an overwhelming share of those who commit these horrible crimes and what do we do? We find new ways of killing them by law, you see. Yeah, and this country is moving backwards. I mean, most in, almost every other industrialized country has abolished capital punishment altogether. This country is looking for new ways of killing people, new ways. No wonder Amnesty International has just denounce it as just an additional violation. And given the Chinese, strangely enough, uh, who themselves execute a lot of people, a reason to say the United States had better look at its own performance in human rights before criticizing the People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. So we don't even deal with current victimization of African Americans in the legal system. 
so let alone with the historical injustices. Mm. Are there any European nations or any Europeans involved in your, your group of 12 eminent uh, persons studying this whole issue? Uh, no, deliberately the, the, the eminent persons are people of African ancestry. So, so, the, so, but when we, have, when we hold congresses, we invite all those who are who are interested in Is there it, any support yeah. from any European nations? Uh, yes, at the, uh, we have had uh, a member of the House of Lords in, in, in Britain coming in, uh, uh, offering, in fact, he's, he's a lawyer, and he's prepared to do some briefs, legal briefs, as to how you can make a case for reparations, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so there are a number, until now, a number sort of liberal type of uh, British and, and uh, French uh, people who, who, say, who mm. are prepared to be on our side. Mm. And then there are one or two members of parliament who are black in the United Kingdom who are also committed to reparations, uh, both internally within the United Kingdom, the way African Americans are here, and also as part of a global, global movement. Mm. Dr. Masriri, not too long ago, the Pope apologized, officially apologized to the continent of Africa because of the, the great enslavement. To your knowledge, has there been any of the Western governments, to include the United States, who have officially apologized for their role in the great enslavement? Mm, no, they haven't. Yeah. There is this idea that like, this is done by people in the past, you see, and that the present generation is uh, not responsible, which is a lot of nonsense. Uh, you and I ob obey the Constitution of the United States. Was it done by this generation? Was it drawn up by the last generation? By the third generation? No, it was done 200 years ago, we obeyed today. You see. So what's generations got to do with whether a particular obligation persists? Yeah. In other words, legal obligations can continue generation after generation. There are laws on the United Nations, on the United States Statutes book, which were passed uh, several hundred years ago. And there are laws within the United States which are based on the English uh, common law, you see, which is even centuries older. Yes. So we obey those laws in spite of the fact that they are passed by, not by us, not by people elected by us, and some of them were passed when this society was not democratic. Similarly, you can have moral obligations that transcend generations. Just as we obey the Constitution and laws in spite of the fact that they are centuries old, we can respond to moral obligations in spite of the fact that they are centuries old. Uh, and governments should take that into account when uh, when they do that. The, but it's true that there hasn't been an apology for enslavement and there, and there certainly hasn't been any apology for colonization. Uh, individuals in the West may, may apologize, but that's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I've asked you and I've exhausted just about everything that I wanted to ask you. Mm -hmm. To what would you like to elaborate on? Anything that you would like to say that needs to be said in so far? Not so much, je not just reparations, but anything else that you want to elaborate on? Now's the time. <laughs> well, there's so much I would like to explore with you and your viewers, but uh, it, it may not be possible to 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 engage engage them all. But. Uh, I do want to emphasize this particular sub-theme that there are aspects of the damage uh, that are occurring in parts of the black world that we don't normally cover at all. It could be the streets of Rio de Janeiro where school kids disproportionately black, kids not at school but kids disproportionately black in the streets can be executed by the police because somebody has been paid money to get rid of this nuisance. You see, they are treated as the equivalent of vermin in the streets. 
So the, the damage to the value of black lives is horrendous. It's, it's, it's sometimes may even not, may be unconscious. It can happen in France, where uh, not so long ago, a suspect, uh, 16, 17 year old Zairean boy taken in for questioning by the police and killed in there. And they say the policeman didn't know his gun was was loaded. I'm sure he, the policeman would never exper have experimented with a white kid to check whether the gun was loaded or not loaded. So there is a kind of devaluation of black lives as well as devaluation of black dignity that is current, insistent, continuing and very widespread, you see. And, and it is that element that has to be handled. Now, it can be handled partly by reparations, but it can also be handled by a lot of other ways, including what your program is doing, that is helping to tell people more about what is going on. It also can be helped by identifying the positive things which are happening in the black world, because most of the news is bad news that appears uh, in the black world. And finally, it can be helped by transforming the way we portray the black world in our educational systems. Uh, we teach kids about Africa in ways which are disgraceful. It still happens. I have served on the syllabus review committee of the state of New York, uh, and there is disproportionate bias in how young Americans are exposed to other cultures and civilizations. And we need to address those issues as well. Well, sir, I want to thank you very much for this interview. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I hope you'll set aside some time sometime in the future where we can sit down and chat again. I certainly hope so. All right. Thank